Welcome to Davo Bible Community Church's online worship service. To get the best online worship experience, please be reminded of the following. Prepare your heart and your mind to worship God. Express your adoration and thanksgiving to God by participating in the praise and worship. Pray for wisdom and enlightenment as you listen to the preaching. Take notes, be at a comfortable place, and remove all possible distractions. Use the widest screen possible. Make sure your audio is loud enough to accommodate the other viewers with you. Encourage your family and friends to join the service with you. If you are not living near each other, you can share this service by sending them the link to this service through your news feed or through Messenger. If it is the first Sunday of the month, you are encouraged to prepare the holy elements ahead of time for the Holy Communion. We're almost minutes away to our worship proper. But before we start, let me take you through our church's mission and vision. Our mission, to obey the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ in disciple-making by discipling people, Reaching Peace Initiatives, Collaborative Partnerships, and Church Planting. Our vision, a disciple-building community where every member is a disciple-builder committed to community transformation that seeks to rescue and release children and families from the cycle of sin and poverty in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit for the glory of God the Father.
to Davo Bible Community Church's online worship service. To get the best online worship experience, please be reminded of the following. Prepare your heart and your mind to worship God. Express your adoration and thanksgiving to God by participating in the praise and worship. Pray for wisdom and enlightenment as you listen to the preaching. Take notes, be at a comfortable place, and remove all possible distractions. Use the widest screen possible. Make sure your audio is loud enough to accommodate the other viewers with you. Encourage your family and friends to join the service with you. If you are not living near each other, you can share this service by sending them the link to this service through your newsfeed or through Messenger. If it is the first Sunday of the month, you are encouraged to prepare the holy elements ahead of time for the Holy Communion. We're almost minutes away to our worship proper. But before we start, let me take you through our church's mission and vision. Our mission, to obey the great commission of our Lord Jesus Christ in disciple-making by discipling people, Bridging Peace Initiatives, Collaborative Partnerships, and Church Planting. Our vision, a disciple-building community where every member is a disciple-builder committed to community transformation that seeks to rescue and release children and families from the cycle of sin and poverty in Jesus' name by the power of the Spirit for the glory of God the Father. Good morning, DBC, and welcome to our online worship service this beautiful Sunday. As we continue to live our lives despite the pandemic, 
we also continue to praise the Lord. So let us go to Psalm 63 and do our responsive reading. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. Together. On my bed I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. Yes, church, let us together sing praise us to the Lord and ask Him to open the eyes of our hearts so that we can see Him for who He is. He is lifted high, shining above in glory. Hallelujah. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you I want to see you Open the eyes of my heart, Lord Open the eyes of my heart I want to see you you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Your power and love as we sing, Holy, 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 you are high and lifted up, and you're shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, 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 you are high and lifted up, and you're shining in the light. Of your glory, Lord, pour out your power and love as we sing, Holy, 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 you are Holy, 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 I want to see. church as we desire to see the Lord 
We desire to see Him for who He is. He is an amazing God. He has blessed us with so much. And so, one thing that we can do to declare that He is good is to give thanks to Him, for He is an amazing God indeed. Hallelujah. Amen and amen. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, Love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever, God is faithful. Forever, God is strong. Forever. God is with us forever and ever, forever. From the rising to the setting sun, His love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will carry on. His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong. God is with us forever and ever, forever. Forever, God is faithful. Forever, God is strong. Forever, God is with us forever and ever, forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us. Forever and ever, forever. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. From the beginning until now, and even until the age, from the age of Elijah, yes, we are experiencing God's love and His amazing grace. Amen. Hallelujah. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. And all these are days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice 
in the desert crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hail, salvation comes. Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh, and these are the days of your servant David rebuilding a temple of praise, and these are the days of the harvest, the fields are wide in your world, and we are the laborers in your vineyard declaring the word of the Lord. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, Lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee, and out of Zion's hill salvation comes. yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. As we continue with our worship church, let us be reminded that all the things that happened, they happened because of a reason. And by God's grace, everything also comes to fruition, comes to positive, comes to good endings. And this is the way of God. Because we can declare that everything is grace. Your joy when the morning comes, your hope keeps me looking up. You are enough. Your peace, the eye of every storm, your strength. When my heart is warm, you are enough. Whatever comes my way, I will walk through the flame. You're turning my fear to faith, my doubt to praise, and everything is grace. Your love. When the wait is long, your voice keeps me holding on. You are enough. My delight with bitterness comes close. My portion, the only thing I know. You are enough. Whatever comes my way. We'll walk through the flame You're turning my fear to faith My doubt to praise And everything is grace True in the pouring rain True in the 
the crashing waves It's true even in my pain My heart can say that everything is grace Time after time Your redemption is mine Again and again Your grace is every day
Good day to all. Happy Sunday, DBC family, and to all our online viewers and everyone else who has joined us for worship this morning. Welcome, and may God's peace, protection, and provision be given to all of you. Let us pray. God, our Father, Father of mercies and God of all comfort, we thank you today that we can continue to worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you that despite this uh, quarantine, this lockdown, we can still worship you in spirit and in truth. For that is who you are. For that is what you are looking for from worshipers. That those who worship you will worship you in spirit. And so, Father, today, may God the Holy Spirit, who is not confined or restricted by space and time, minister to your people as they watch and listen and join us in worship through this online ministry. We pray that you will minister to them and bless them according to their needs. May you, O God, address their concerns. May they experience you in a very personal and real way as they, O oh God, connect with you through your word. And we pray, Lord, that today you will speak to us through your word and that you will grant us the joy of knowing you and being transformed by you even through our circumstances. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Our passage this morning is taken from the book of James, chapter 5, 7 to 12. It says, Be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. Verse 8, You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Don't grumble against one another, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. The judge is standing at the door. Brothers and sisters, as an example of patience in the face of suffering, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. As you know, we count as blessed those who have persevered. And you have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear, not by heaven or by earth or by anything else. All you need to say is a simple yes or no. Otherwise, you will be condemned. The title I've given to this message is Waiting Just a Little Bit More. Can you wait a little bit more? Can you wait 
a little bit more from ECQ to GCQ until we can have barbecue. Until we have the IQ to learn from the ECQs, I guess we have to wait longer than we hope to. Who likes to wait? Generally, mothers do. I don't mean they like to wait, but somehow they seem to have the inherent capacity to wait than more than the fathers. I guess they have developed it through their motherhood. People before the pandemic, before the lockdown, and the quarantine abhor waiting. Most people. This is so as this generation falls under the category of the fast, the furious, and freedom generation. A generation who wants everything to be fast. From fast food to instant coffee to quick tellers and automated machines. Furious because anything slow, we get furious. Slow internet connections, slow social services, slow traffic, queuing lines. We are easily agitated and upset. Now people are bored, agitated, and furious about the lockdowns, about the quarantines, the restrictions of movements. Why? Because we are a generation that wants freedom. We don't like martial laws, dictatorships, and the like. We want to go around, move around, and roam around, and, but not just stay around. There is a nation that loves freedom so much, they don't want restrictions. This nation detests confinements and limitations. As a result, they have the most number of COVID-19 victims. I guess one just has to know the difference between being carefree and being careful. COVID-19 has clearly disciplined this generation. The enforced restrictions, the lockdowns and quarantines, the fear of contagion somehow has made us conscious of our social responsibility, that our freedom is not absolute and it is not to be used and enjoyed simply for selfish ends. Our mothers taught us that. Praise God for our mothers and for mother-in-laws. I am blessed with a wonderful and gracious mother-in-law. I praise God that my wife has her traits, beautiful, patient, caring, and very industrious. Well, going back to our topic, this fast, furious, and freedom-loving generation, because of this pandemic, this generation is being shaped and transformed into becoming patient, persevering, prudent generation. While most people these days still don't like waiting, but the reality is a lot of good things come out of our lives while waiting. It takes some months for a baby to be fully formed and to come out from the womb. It takes some years for the child to start to go to school and some years to finish. In fact, going to a good restaurant may also involve waiting. You know, have you, have you noticed that? That dining in a good expensive restaurant involves waiting too? You see, the more expensive the restaurant, the longer you wait. There are actually five different waits when you go to, to a good restaurant. First, you wait to get a seat. Second, you wait to get the menu. Then, you wait to order. 
And then after ordering, you wait to get the food served. And after eating, then you wait for the bill. And yet, they have the nerve to call the other guy the waiter. When in fact, you are the one who waited. Isn't it? These waiting periods, like what we are in right now, this quarantine, this lockdown, the stoppage of business operations, or the irregularity of work and activities caused by this pandemic are what we can call the commas of life. They all require and necessitate from us patience. Now, who needs patience? Do you need patience? And do you need it now? I think you need patience. Today, we are going to look at what James has to say on how to develop patience. It is said that patience is the mother of all virtues. It is the mother of virtues because it gives birth as well as nurtures the enjoyment of other virtues, especially the cardinal virtues of faith, hope, and love. We cannot enjoy our faith, hope, as well as exercise our deep love without patience. In fact, the first quality mark of love is patience. Love is patient, the Bible says. You need patience in every area of your life. I believe through this trial, this pandemic, God is shaping us, teaching us, and calling us to grow and experience patience. My prayer today is that God will give you the patience to listen to this message and grow in your patience. In this passage, James uses the word patience or perseverance six times. The Bible says that patience is planted by the Holy Spirit, propped up by prayer and God's Word, produced by trials, and perfected by love. Here in our passage, James uses three different illustrations to teach us when to be patient, why be patient, and how to be patient. Do you like that? The word patience in Greek is the word makrothomos. Makro meaning long, and thomos, from which we get the word thermometer, means heat. It literally means it takes a long time for you to get hot or to overheat. As such, it can also mean long-suffering or to suffer long. This pandemic is causing us to suffer long enough that the need for long-suffering is of the utmost. When should I be patient? James isn't saying we have to be patient all the time. But there are three special times when you need the extra dose of patience. First, when circumstances are uncontrollable. Have you figured out that a lot of life is beyond your control? You cannot keep your hands on everything. James uses a farmer as an example or illustration of when circumstances are uncontrollable. Verse 7 says, Be patient then, brothers, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is. Let me tell you this. Don't go into farming unless you've got patience. Part of the job description of being a farmer is you do a lot of waiting. 
waiting to plow, waiting to plant, and waiting to prune. There are lots of factors in waiting. Yet more than the factors of waiting on things to do are the factors that the farmer has no control over, like the weather, the rain, the heat, the economy, the labor practices, and so on. If you have a lot of faith, you can be a farmer. But if you don't have a lot of faith, don't be a farmer because it takes patience. You deal with a lot of uncontrollable factors when you go to farming. The circumstances, the uncontrollable circumstances in life. Even in Palestine, where James is talking about, it wasn't the best of farming land. So they needed extra patience in, in their farming. Have you noticed that when we realize a situation is beyond our control, we still try to control it? Oftentimes we do that. How do we do that? By worrying. We think that worry will control a situation. To worry about something you can change, listen to this, to worry about something you can change is dumb. And to worry about something you cannot change is dumber. It is useless. Either way, you shouldn't worry. We need to have patience in uncontrollable circumstances like we are in. Like what we are in right now. Do you think that our present circumstance now requires the virtue of patience as the most desirable virtue to acquire? No wonder God allowed this predicament for us to want and have patience. When do we need patience? When circumstances are uncontrollable, and second, when people are unchangeable. When people won't change, we need patience. When they resist correction and adjustments, we need patience. The Apostle James gives us an example of the prophets in verse 10 as an example of patience in the face of suffering. Take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. What was the duty of prophets? Prophets help people change in order to bring them back to God, to be different in their behavior. Have you noticed that there are people who simply resist change? And that's why to be a prophet requires a lot of patience because there are people who resist change. When you make any tiny suggestion to these people, they resist you. In the early goings of the quarantine, there were stubborn people here in our city who resisted the quarantines. They still gather to gamble in cockfighting arena that as a result, many got the infectious disease that caused the untimely deaths of some. Do you have anybody in your life right now who refuses to change? Do you know how difficult it is to live with that kind of person? We need patience with people. Joyce Lander, a business executive, calls these people, stubborn people, irregular people. They are people who only see their own way they may never change so what are we going to do about them what are you going to do about it with these people james says have patience macrothomos it means it takes a long time for you to get fiery to be patient means to have a long fuse so that you won't blow up quickly and you don't get overheated with people. James says you need to be patient 
when circumstances are uncontrollable, and when people are unchangeable and won't cooperate with you. Third thing, when do we need patience? When problems are unexplainable. The classic example he gives is in verse 11. You have heard of Job's perseverance. Job sported in the WWF of suffering. The World Wrestling Federation of Suffering. That's what WWF stands for. He won the championship there. Job was the wealthiest man that ever lived on this planet during his time. He had everything going on for him. But in a two-day period, everything fell apart. He went bankrupt. His children were killed. He got an incurable, deadly disease that was very painful. And you think you've got problems? And you think you had a rough day? Remember Job. He lost his family. He lost his friends. He lost his finances and he lost his form or fitness. He was suffering materially, physically, and socially. Every kind of way. One day, his wife comes to him and says to him, Curse God and die. Now that's a support system to you. God allowed the devil to take away everything in his life except his nagging wife. The worst part of Job's suffering was that he had absolutely no idea why it was happening to him. For 37 chapters in the book of Job, God doesn't even talk to him and tell him why it was happening. There was no apparent reason for his misfortune. For all we know, a wager has been arranged in heaven between God and the devil. The devil's wager was in a form of a challenge to God's boast of his man, Job. You know, we always talk about having faith in God. But in this story of Job, God is showing faith in a man. And this man is Job. And the challenge of the devil to God was, does Job serve God for nothing? This seems to be a fair challenge for a wager from Satan. If it were betted to us, will God win? Will God's faith on us be a success? Give him honor? Will you serve God for nothing in return? No blessing attached to it? No payoff? No heaven? No assurance of provision and protection from COVID-19? Will you continue to worship and serve God if there were no payoffs? You see, the devil insinuated that Job was faithful in serving God because God has blessed him and has put a hedge of protection around him so that no harm can touch him. Remove the protection, he would say. Remove the blessings and Job will curse you, God, to your face. That's what the devil made his challenge to God. This story of Job is not simply a question why righteous people suffer, but a question why do people serve God? Why do people worship God? What is man's real motivation and real interest of why he is serving and worshiping God? Will a person serve God even when his life turns tragic? When everything will fall apart, will be taken away from you? Job did. Job lost everything. Yet he maintained his faith. Will a person serve God even when he has to stand alone? Job did. 
his wife dishonored him. His friends condemned him. And God seems to have abandoned him. But again, Job maintained his integrity and Job remained faithful to God. Will a man trust God even when God remains silent in times of adversity? Job did. Yes, he complained. Yes, he argued and questioned God. But never did he throw away his faith. For in his complaining, he exercised his faith. How? By believing that God exists. And his constant desire to have an audience with God made him earnestly seek God. Are not these actions of Job a clear expression of faith as described and defined by Hebrews 11.6? It says that faith is coming to God, believing that He exists and rewards those who earnestly seek Him. Of all people, Job had the privilege to say, Why me? Life is not fair. That is true. God never said life would be fair. A lot of things in this life don't make sense. Maybe we'll never understand on this side of heaven. Job did not fully understand everything. In all of these unexplained problems, he held on to trust. Job did not understand, but he maintained his faith. He lost most of what were important to him, but he never lost his faith in God. Sometimes, we just can't figure out our problems. But it is in the arena that God developed Job's patience. In the arena of adversity. In the arena of suffering. God was working in the life of Job. Developing his patience polishing his faith and perfecting his character. When circumstances are uncontrollable, when people are unchangeable, when problems are unexplainable, you really need patience. Why? Why be patient? Because God is in control. Verse 8 tells us, Be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Three times in this passage, James says, The Lord's coming is near. Jesus is coming back. Do you believe that? That is the ultimate proof that God is in control. Nothing can stop it. The Bible talks more about Jesus' second coming than His first coming. And His second coming is when He will come to judge the world. God is in control of history because history is His story. He got it all planned out. Everything is on schedule. Nothing is late. It's all moving toward a climax. The reason why we can have hope that this pandemic will end is because this is not how God will end history as revealed in the Bible. God is in control of history. God is in control of every event that takes place in this world. God's purpose for your life is greater than any problem you're facing right now. God is in control. In the Philips translation of verse 8, it says, So must you be patient, resting your hearts on the ultimate certainty. Take note of that. Resting your hearts on the ultimate certainty. The Lord's coming is very near. 
Though a situation may be out of control, no circumstance is out of control from God. God is in control. Although I cannot control everything that happens in my life, God can. So I ought to trust Him because God is in control and everything is working out for good. Just be patient. Job persevered. God's timing is perfect. He's never late. Some of you are experiencing a real delay right now, but God's delays never thwart His purpose. You may be experiencing some setbacks in your business, in your plans and programs in the church, or in your work, or in your studies. Because of this pandemic, you see, a setback is anything that sets you back instead of setting you forward. You are afraid that these setbacks are irreversible and you worry and fear you may not be able to bounce back and be able to come back for good. If you are a child of God, a follower of Jesus, be patient. Trust God for He is in control. Why be patient? Not only because God is in control, because God rewards patience. That's the second point. Why or second reason why we need to be patient. God rewards patience. In verse 11, it says there, As you know, we consider blessed those who have persevered. Take note of the word blessed. The second half of Job's life was more blessed than the first half. God doubled everything he had. He had lost. Except his wife. It pays to be patient. To have more than one wife, you know. Just kidding. There are all kinds of rewards. Your character grows, you get along with people better, you're happier and you reach your goals when you are patient. And there are lots of benefits of being patient. God rewards patience. You will be honored by others if you are patient. People will say to you, he's a patient person. But not just on this side of eternity will you be honored and rewarded when you are patient. For the Bible says, God will also reward you on the other side of eternity in heaven. In Matthew 5, 13 to 14, it says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward. Where? in heaven for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you when people put you down when they criticize you be patient because there's going to be a reward in heaven it is our natural tendency one of the strongest desires in life is when you are hurt you want to get even. You want to retaliate, to get revenge, to take matters in your own hands when you are hurt. When you get criticized and you want to criticize back. If you get insulted, you want to insult back. Revenge, retaliation are the natural thing, but that's the opposite of patience. James says that next time someone criticizes you, before you strike back, think about this. Is it worth giving up the reward I'm going to receive in heaven? I'm going to enjoy that a whole lot longer than the temporary pleasure of revenge. Besides, God has promised, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. You need to be patient because God is in control 
and He is going to reward patience. Why be patient? The third reason is because God is working things out. Often behind the scenes, things we don't even see. He is at work, but we don't see Him at work. Verse 11 tells us, You have heard of Job's perseverance and have seen what the Lord finally brought about. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. The Lord rewarded Job. The Lord was working around the things that was happening in and through the life of Job. God was working all the time that Job wasn't aware of that God was doing something in and through and around his life, what was happening and what was taking place around him. A delay does not mean a denial. Yes, Job was asking for God's audience, God's answer to his suffering. But it seems that he did not receive an answer from God. But it doesn't mean that God was not listening. A delay does not mean a denial. If you have been praying for an answer to prayer and you haven't gotten it, you think God doesn't want to give it to you. No, a delay is not a denial. We have to learn the difference between a no and a not yet from God's answer. Big difference. We want and we want it now. That's our attitude. But we have to be patient. God is at work even when we don't see what's going on. God was at work in Job's life even when he didn't know. Remember God's way of answering prayers. It, either it's a yes, a no, or a not yet. Story of Philip Brooks, a famous pastor of the last century, was said that one day he was in his office pacing the floor, frustrated. Somebody walked in and saw him at, and asked, What's the matter, pastor? He said, I am in a hurry, but God is not. God says, be patient because I'm working things out for your good. While I am waiting, God is working. You need to remember that. Your hands may be tied and this situation may be uncontrollable, but it is not uncontrollable in God's viewpoint. In advance, thank God because He's working things out. He gives the illustration of the farmer. When the farmer plants the seed, he's waiting for that seed. While he's waiting, God's working behind the scene to cause the plant to sprout. God is working behind the scenes so to cause the plant to sprout. He's creating the conditions so that at the right time, in the right way, there will be a harvest. The farmer waits, God works. Philippians 2.13 says, God is at work within you. Maybe you can't see it, but He is. Romans 8.28 tells us again, and we know that in all things, God is working for the good. In every circumstance in your life, God is working. Just be patient. I don't know what kind of problem you have this week, but regardless of the problem you're going through right now, whether it be financial, relational, or health, God is working in that problem. Be patient and trust Him. What am I supposed to be doing while I'm waiting on God? How am I going to be patient? The Apostle James says, Consider these three illustrations, Farmer, Judge, and Job. Look at them and realize what they did. And then you do what they did while you are waiting on God. The first, the farmer. What did the farmer do? The farmer waited expectantly 
verse 7, see how the farmer waits. I must expect a harvest. I must believe that it is inevitable that I've done the right thing. What does a farmer do while he is waiting on God? Will he just sit down and watch reruns on televisions all day while he's waiting on the harvest? No. The farmer, while waiting for the harvest, will be preparing for what he is going to get from what he planted. He will be preparing for the harvest. He's getting ready. Waiting is a time for preparations, which shows your expectations. We demonstrate our expectation by our preparation. We get ready for the answer in advance. Psalm 130 verse 5 says, I wait expectantly, trusting God to help, for He has promised. Wow! Highlight expectantly. What are you waiting for from God? Maybe to heal a long-term illness or to transform your marriage or maybe to reverse your financial problems or for God to reach to your teenager for Christ. Do you really expect Him to do that? The Bible says, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. If you do expect God to do it, eventually prove it by preparing. How can you prove that you're expecting God to do something? Simple. What you are going to get ready for. Are you preparing for the answer? If the answer came today, would you be ready to receive it? How can I prepare? The way you get ready for something is by preparing in advance. While you're waiting, you're preparing. Preparing demonstrates again expectation. A lot of times when I'm waiting on God, He's really waiting on me. He was ready to give the answer a long time ago, but I wasn't ready to receive it. He's saying, grow up, get some spiritual depth in your life. I want to bless your life, but you cannot handle the blessing. I want to pour on you. It's so great and you're such a puny, tiny, weeny spiritually. You're not ready to handle the blessing. When you've got some spiritual muscle in your life, I will bless you beyond what you can imagine. Waiting is a time to get ready. Prepare. Jesus waited 30 years before He began His ministry. 30 years of preparation. He accomplished more in three years than we would in a lifetime. Abraham waited for 25 years before he got the promised heir. Moses waited for 80 years before he got called by God and used him to be Israel's deliverer. Joseph waited for 30 difficult years for his childhood dream to come true. Henry Blackaby says in his book, In Experiencing God, God matches character with the assignment. So before he gives the assignment, whether it be an assignment of reward or blessing or an assignment of some task, God shapes first, builds first, and prepares first the character. Isaiah 49 verse 23 says, The Lord says, No one who waits for my help will be disappointed. The second reason on how we are to show or exercise our patience is to imagine ourselves before a courtroom judge. How do we behave before a courtroom judge? We wait quietly. 
James the Apostle points out the fact that we have a tendency to run off out the mouth when we are irritated, when we are tense, when we are under pressure, when things aren't going our way and things are under our control. The Apostle James warns us of two things to avoid. One is grumbling. Don't grumble, he says, against each other, brothers, or you will be judged. Why does he talk about grumbling right in the middle of patience? It's hard to be quiet when you are prostrated. Have you experienced that? When you're prostrated, you want everybody to know about it. You want to grumble, mumble, moan, and gripe. Now, technically, there is a difference between grumbling and complaining. To grumble is to blame on someone about something because of malice and prejudice. It is motivated by spite, by malice and dissatisfaction over someone because you think evil of that person. To complain, on the other hand, is to express how and what you feel about something that legitimately bothers you. Such complaints are welcomed by God. The Bible calls this a lament, a cry, a plea. In verse, rather in Psalm 142, 1 and 2 says, With my voice I cry out to the Lord. With my voice I plead for mercy to the Lord. I pour out my complaint before Him. I tell my trouble before Him. What God does not accept is grumbling. James, the apostle, says, don't grumble. The New English Bible says, don't blame your troubles on one another. When you get up in the morning, do you rise and whine? Hit the ground, griping? Everything is bad. You grumble. If you come home at night, dog tired, and then you murmur and grumble again. All because you are so negative about many things. I heard about a lady who griped at her husband all the time. Constantly, she would nag and grumble about her husband. Finally, her husband died and she put on his tombstone rest in peace then they went and read the will he willed five dollars to his wife and everything else he gave away to his secretary the wife was so mad and angry at her dead husband that she went back and changed what she wrote in the tombstone writing there, till we meet again. I can just imagine if they met, rather if they meet again, I can just imagine if they meet again, surely the peace will cease. Swearing is another thing that we are to avoid. Verse 12 says, Above all, my brothers, don't swear. Swearing can also mean promising with a curse. Does waiting ever tempt you to swear? A story of two men who got marooned in a tiny island, surrounded with sharks. One prayed about and about to promise to God, saying, God, if you will rescue us, I will stop, says his companion. Don't make a promise yet. Help is coming. You know, there are people, when they get prostrated, they make promises and Bind these promises with curses. Like, kung tabangan ko nimo, mamatay ko kung di na ako bayran, hindi nga akong mautang. 
Magana ba? They would bind themselves with a curse. What happens when you get uptight? When you're prostrated and things aren't going your way and things are beyond your control, how do you normally respond? Typically, we take it out on those closest to us. We unload our frustrations, our disappointments on our husbands, our wives, our children, and it's not even their fault. But we're frustrated and impatient. We displace our anger and focus it on those we love the most. That's unfortunate. James the Apostle says, don't do that. Lamentation 3.26 says, It's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Take note of the word quietly. In Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3 says, These things won't happen right away, but slowly, steadily, surely the time approaches when the vision will be fulfilled. If it seems slow, do not despair. For these things will surely come to pass. Just be patient. They will not be overdue a single day. Do you have a dream? A goal in life? A vision that God gives you? God says it will be right on target. At the right time. In the right way. You wait expectantly and you wait quietly how do we show our patience how are we to wait the final example is job wait confidently verse 10 in the face of suffering take the prophets or the patriarch job Job never lost his confidence in all that he did. When the outlook is bad, Job looked up in trust to God. Job waited on God confidently. How? In trust. By trust, it is an acronym. I have used the word trust as an acronym that means T that stands for tell God exactly how you feel. This is how Job managed and coped with his situation and how he grew in his patience and matured in his character. Trust. T stands for tell God exactly how you feel. Job 7 11 says, Therefore I will not keep silent. I will speak out in in the anguish of my spirit, I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. You know, God wants you to be honest with your feelings. If you want to grow in your patience and mature in faith, tell God how you feel. If you are angry, if you are frustrated, disappointed, tell it to Him, not to anyone else. Go direct to God. He can handle your emotions. He made those emotions. In fact, if you read the book of Psalms, they're full of laments there, complaints. God inspired those writings, telling us that we can tell God how we feel. Second, in the trust is R. In trust is refuse to give up faith. Job, despite the the tragedy that happened to him did not give up his faith. Despite the loss that he went through in life, did not give up faith. In Job 1, 21 to 22, Job said, I came naked from my mother's womb and I shall have nothing when I die. The Lord gave me everything I had and they were his to take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all of this, Job did not sin by blaming God. You, in trust, understand his purpose. Job did not understand what was happening to him. He was confused. He was in the dark. In Job 23, 10, 
somehow he had a glimpse of what was taking place and he said but he knows the way that i take when he has tested me i will come forth as gold s in trust is seek his forgiveness and wisdom job 42 5 and 6 says my ears had heard of you but now my eyes have seen you therefore i despise myself and repent in dust and ashes when the lord appeared before job and when the lord confronted job and explained to job his sovereignty and control over everything that takes place in the world job humbled himself before god and repented before him before the lord t is total surrender job in job 11:15 says if even if god takes my life i will still trust him that's trust for you in micah 7:7 7, 7 says i will wait confidently for god this is how we are to show our patience remembering the perseverance of the patriarch job when you got a problem that is unexplainable and you encounter a person who is unchangeable or you are in a circumstance that is uncontrollable then wait confidently because God is in control he is at work and he will reward your patience how do you wait confidently sit still don't get nervous don't panic or get anxious don't take matters into your own hands and work things out no remember Psalm 37 verse 7 it says be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him to act God is calling us to be patient he is shaping our lives changing molding transforming us using this trial for us to grow in patience god bless you let's pray god our father thank you for being so patient with us despite our stubbornness and our uh, reluctance to cooperate with your work lord continue to be gracious and continue lord to finish what you have started in us we put our trust in you O oh god may you continue to grow in us the virtue of patience so that in all things we will mature faith hope and love the lord bless you and keep you the lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you the lord lift up his countenance and grant you peace now and forevermore amen Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What a wonderful message. Indeed, church, let us put that to mind when we go by this week knowing and declaring that God is good and faithful and His love endures forever. Amen? So come on, let's sing our song in response, declaring that God is faithful, He is strong, and He is with us forever and ever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thanks to the Lord, our God and King, His love endures forever. For He is good, He is above all things, His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. With a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, his love endures forever For the life that's been reborn
His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. live your lives declaring that this week and every day. Amen. God bless you.